Well, I welcome you to our exploration of the seven myths of eschatology. Eschatology, as you probably realize, is the study of the last things. For many people, it's the last thing studied. And it's a very, very forbidding topic for most pastors. They avoid it for a number of good reasons. To address eschatology, you really need to have in view God's whole plan of redemption. And so uh, that's ambitious. And that's why many people hesitate to jump in because there's a comprehensive aspect to this. And so some people might call the myths of eschatology the pitfalls of eschatology because we're going to talk about some topics that are clearly very, very controversial. And let me highlight something. It's not our intention to promote a particular view. What we're hoping to do is to raise up what we call self-feeders, people who understand their Bible well enough to find their way around and study it and come to their own conclusions. We will share with you what our views are in the hopes that that's useful to you. And uh, you may, in your study, come to a different clu- con- uh, conclusion. That's fine. But uh, this, our intention is to be helpful, not to force a particular view. But we're going to explore seven specific, what I'll call pitfalls or myths of eschatology. The first is the dominant one called the rapture. We'll also address the controversy about does the church go through the great tribulation? You talk to three pastors and you get three different perspectives of that. And is there a literal millennium? That may come as a surprise. Because nine out of ten churches don't believe there is. So we'll talk about that. And we're also taught that the church somehow is supposed to replace Israel. Is that true or is that a heresy? And then we'll talk about the Davidic covenant. Whatever happened to that? That's disappeared. And the other question that will come up is everyone in heaven equal. It's amazing that some of our favorite uh, friends and groups and so forth take for granted for some reason, that everybody in heaven is equal. Is that what the G- is Jesus taught? And then if under grace, does behavior matter? So these are seven pitfalls. Let's take the first one, the rapture. This clearly is the most preposterous belief of biblical Christianity. And we, in dealing with this, need to be candid and recognize why our friends probably think we've slipped a gear or two, because it's such a bizarre belief. The only problem is, the only thing it's got going for it is that it's clearly biblical. And you'll find a whole bunch of verses that deal with what we call the second coming of Jesus. And I won't go through each one of these, but in, in your notes, you'll find this list of verses. And each one of these describes an event that you and I would recognize as what we call the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that there's plenty of verses all through the scripture on that topic. However, when you look at these verses, and you'll discover that we're dealing here with how many? 20 of them right here that are of a particular style. We find there's another group that are in distinction with these. John 14, the upper room discussion. And we go through and we find an equivalent number that describe an event that is different than you and I think of as the second coming. And for lack of another term, we'll label that the rapture. If you take those two groups and contrast them, you'll discover in the rapture, there is a translation of believers. In the second coming, there's no translation involved. They're distinctively different. In the rapture, the translated saints go to heaven. In the second coming, the translated saints return to the earth from heaven. They're very different. In the rapture, the earth is not judged. The earth is judged in the second coming. A very key idea of the rapture, it can happen at any moment. We're taught to expect it. It could happen before this briefing is over. And it doesn't have any, uh, there's no signs. The other, the second coming, follows a series of events that have to precede it. 
It's very different. It's common knowledge that the rapture does not appear in the Old Testament. I put that in quotes because I'm going to surprise you with some alternative viewpoints about that. But clearly the second coming is predicted, obviously, all through the Old Testament. The rapture involves believers only. The second coming involves everybody. Every eye shall see them, all the entire earth. The rapture occurs before the day of wrath. The second coming concludes what we call the day of wrath. The rapture has no reference to Satan. The second coming, Satan is the principal focus. In the rapture, he comes for his own. In the second coming, he comes with his own. They're distinctively different. We need to be sensitized to that. In the rapture, he comes in the air, but in the second coming, he comes to the earth. And it's astonishing to realize how many pastors don't teach the return of Christ to rule on the earth. In the rapture, he claims his bride. In the second coming, he comes with his bride. Different issue. The rapture, only his own shall see him. And the second coming, every eye shall see him. And the rapture, the great tribulation follows. In the second coming, the millennium, the millennium begins. The rapture is only the church believers. And second coming, most scholars believe the Old Testament sa uh, saved later. But anyway, the harpazo. The word in the Greek is arpazo. That term is the very term in the text. And we're going to talk about the promise of it, the process by which it occurs, the purpose of it, and the prophetic. There's four different dimensions, four different perspectives in the text about it, the harpazo. And in John 14, we have the promise. The process is described in 1 Thessalonians 4. The purpose of it in 1 Corinthians 15 and the prophetic profile is throughout the whole Old Testament. The whole Old Testament built on, on this concept. So let's start with what Jesus did in the upper room. He said to his group, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now it's interesting to see the first of the upper room discourse. These first three verses are about what? You. Ye believe in God. I've told you. For you. I come for you. To receive you. That ye may be with me also. And so forth. The subject is clearly, couldn't be more emphatic. This is all modeled after the classic ancient Jewish wedding. The ketubah was the betrothal. That's when you paid for the bride on the purchase price. The bride was then set apart or sanctified, set apart. And you find that in Isaiah 6, Judges 14, Jeremiah 2. Isaiah 40, it's all through the Old Testament, the ancient Jewish wedding. That's the model we're talking about. And in that, the bridegroom departs to his father's house. He prepares a room addition. The, the bride, in the meantime, prepares for his return. He's left. But she prepares for his return, not knowing that he could come at any time. And when he, she, when he returns, it's a surprise gathering. And that also is described in Jeremiah, several play all through Jeremiah, Psalms, and so forth. Those will be in your notes. And then we have a seven-day marriage supper. They knew how to throw a, throw a party. Seven days. And that's in Judges 14, Matthew 9, and the New Testament also. Okay. The marriage then is fulfilled. The covenant is established. 1 Corinthians 11 is, adapts that to our uh, uh, covenant. The purchase price Jesus paid in 1 Corinthians 6. The bride is set apart in 1 Corinthians, also Hebrews 10. And we're reminded of the covenant in 1 Corinthians 11. The whole model is after the Jewish wedding, in which the bridegroom has left to go to the father's house. He will have an escort accompany him on his return to gather his bride. And that's what's echoed in 1 Thessalonians 4. That's the process. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul gives us the details. Paul says, 
I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also would sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He gave those words to his believers that were alarmed because some of their friends had died and they afraid they might have missed something. No, no, they'll be coming first is what he's pointing out to them and as, as a term of comfort. It's interesting, it makes reference of the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Don't confuse the trump of God with a number of other trumpets. The trump of God only appears twice in the scripture, here and in um, Exodus 19, the voice of God. So track that down carefully as you go through this. But notice what it says here in uh, verse uh, 17. For we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. The term there is harpazo. That's a term in the Greek which means to seize by force, to carry off by force. That's the intent of it. It isn't a subtle thing. It's a direct uh, event, if you will, unmistakable. Now, you say the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. Yes, it does if you have a Latin Bible. Because in the Vulgate, if you read it, you, ha you find the word rapimir, which is the proper tense of rapio, and it's the, uh, our words rapt and rapture come from the past participle of that Latin word. So you say the word rapture doesn't appear in your Bible. Yes, it does in the Latin. And so people who make a point of that are just demonstrating their ignorance. There are actually seven raptures in the Bible. Did you know that? Enoch was raptured in Genesis 5. And it's alluded to in Hebrews 11. Elijah is raptured in 2 Kings 2. Jesus is raptured in Mark 16, Acts 1, Revelation 12. Philip is raptured in Acts 8. Paul is raptured in 2 Corinthians 3. A very unusual event occurs there. And the body of Christ is spoken of as raptured, of course, the one we just talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4. What's interesting, and of course, John uses that very term in Revelation 4, verse 1, which if you're trying to coordinate book of Revelation to the rapture, it's clearly marked for you in the opening verse of chapter 4. What's interesting is in four of these things, it's the actual word arpazo used, by the way. There's no ambiguity here. Now, the purpose of it is explained by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He goes on to say there, he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit uh, incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, the word mysterion here in the Greek is something that previously has been hidden. I'm revealing to you. That's, the word has a little different tone in the Greek. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. See, there will be a generation that won't die because it comes to this point in, in God's program. In a moment... In the twinkling of eye. That's not a blink, by the way. I'll come back to that. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, the twinkling of an eye is a very interesting term. That's not a blink. We think of the twinkling of an eye. No, no. It's the twinkling of an eye is the time it takes for light to pass through your iris. That's a high speed going a very short distance. In fact, it turn, it's our estimate that that's the Planck limit. 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Did you realize there is no unit of time smaller than that? 
it's a shock for us to realize that time is digital. It is granular. Length, mass, energy, and time. These four basic things have what we call the, blank, the Planck limit. There's a, a digital limit to each one of those. There's a limit to length. There's a limit to mass. So, well, there's a limit to time, strangely enough. Most people believe that's the interval of time between the light changing and the horn going along behind you. No, that's a different thing. No, it's the blank limit is 10 to the minus 4. It's the twinkling of an eye. It's an interesting term that Paul can draw a term that will be the most contemporary term you can find in today's physics, interestingly enough. But then Paul goes on to say, so when this corruptible have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The end of death is occurs here. Staggering, staggering concept. But my favorite verse is First uh, John chapter 3, verse 2. I believe this is a verse that you can't really understand without a little background of physics, believe it or not. Because Paul t uh, John tells us something. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now that may not have much meaning to you unless you've had some background in hyperspaces. Hyperspaces are spaces of more than three dimensions. You and I have been programmed in Euclidean geometry. We know of length, width, and height. That's it. We don't realize. It took Einstein to discover we're not in three dimensions, we're in four. The fourth is time. But it's interesting that the scripture anticipates the most advanced physics we have. If I show you a photograph, I'm showing you a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. I can give you a three-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. We call that a hologram. But it's a unique kind of thing. We know that Jesus, in his resurrection body, possesses some very peculiar characteristics. He can enter and leave this room. This room has, conceptually, six sides. A floor, a ceiling, and six walls. Uh, four walls. Four walls, floor, ceiling. We live in a six-sided space. Jesus can enter and leave that space without passing through any one of those six sides, and does so several times in the Scripture. Now, that's a, that tells us that Jesus' resurrection body has some very peculiar attributes. It's not limited to Euclidean geometry as we are. But what's interesting, we're learning here, what, what uh, John is telling us, we know that when he shall appear then to us, we shall be like him because... We shall see him as he actually is. To someone that has a background in hyperspace, that's a staggering statement. That means you and I will not see a representation of him. We will see him as he actually is because we will enjoy the same um, dimensionality. That's really what it's saying. And that's breathtaking. That's a breathtaking verse. So I leave that with you to, cha to challenge you. To move on. We're going to move on here. Now, one of the things that I'm guilty of, I'm puncturing a, a dictum by many theologians. It's very popular to teach that the rapture does not appear in the Old Testament. And I personally take exception to that, and I invite you to come to your own conclusions. I'm going to show you three verses in the Old Testament. You decide what you think it's talking about. Okay. The first is my favorite, Isaiah 26. And we'll start about verse 19 to 21. If you take more than that, it's even more in red. But let me go that way. We'll talk about Zephaniah 2, 3, and Psalm 27, 5. You, let's take a look at this. Isaiah 26, let's start at verse 19. Isaiah is talking now. Get the, put yourself in his shoes in Isaiah. 
God is speaking to Isaiah here. He says, thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Really? He goes on to say, come, my people, enter thou in thy chambers. Not my chambers, your chambers. Enter, uh, come, my people, enter thou in thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment. How long? Until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. What's that talking about? I can't figure out any other thing than what it's talking about. It's talking about the rapture. Let's shift gears. We'll now move to Zephaniah. He makes a peculiar remark here. Zephaniah says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought the, his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Not necessarily, but you might be. What's he talking about? What possibly can he be talking about? I can't figure out where else that would fit unless he's making an allusion to the rapture. That's my view. You make you come to your own conclusion. One last one, Psalm 27. It's a very simple one, and yet it may be the exclamation point on all of them. Psalm 27, 5, For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Boy, I, that's where I want to be. I want to be hidden in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me on what? On a rock. And what is the rock? Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, the rock is always whom? Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a metaphor the Holy Spirit uses consistently. So consistently, there's a, a label for it. It's called the principle of expositional constancy. And the rock is the Holy Spirit always uses of Jesus Christ, just as the Holy Spirit never speaks of himself. And that's why the unnamed servant is the, is the, the null response to that. Anyway, so that's the rapture. That's one of seven what I'll call pitfalls. That's a thing that... Tragically, there are many good Christians that don't understand or embrace or appreciate or what, that's, what that includes. You come to your own conclusions. Don't buy it because I'm selling it. Look at it as if it fits your study of the Scripture. But that leads to another controversy. A lot of arguments about this. Does the church go through the Great Tribulation? There are a lot of really good Christian scholars that believe the church goes through the tribulation. I don't happen to believe that. Doesn't mean I'm right. But this is a this is a stumbling block for many. Well, let's take a look at seven letters. How many epistles are in the Old Testament, in the New Testament? Well, 14 Pauline and seven more. So 14 plus 7 is 21. Ah, there's seven we always overlook that are written none other than by Jesus himself. Because they're tucked away in Revelation 2 and 3, the most important chapters of Revelation in the first place, by the Messiah himself. The seven churches. Why did Jesus pick these seven churches to be representative? They're strange seven churches that he chose. Many of those you hadn't heard of beforehand. They each have a strange structure. They all close with a catchphrase. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now we discover by studying these, there are multiple levels. And three are obvious. There's a fourth that comes as a surprise. They're clearly, they were local churches. They were real. This has been researched very extensively by William Ramsey. These were actual churches back in those days. And the problems they had 
are reflected in the letter. So there is a local application of them that is not to be dismissed. But we also know they're admonitory. Because Jesus says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So in other words, it's written to all churches. There's a focus on each one, but they all apply to all of them is the point. That's why it's, it's admonitory. There are admonitions for all of us. Okay, that's pretty obvious. But it also, it's personal. It's homiletic, if I can use that term. Because he that hath an ear, and I usually say, how many of you have an earlobe? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, that's written to you, personally. Not collectively, personally. So that's homiletic. So far, so good. We can hammer that through. There is a fourth application that comes as a surprise. And that, that's the prophetic application. Now, we discover by looking at them, they lay out the history of the church. First of all, we discover that each letter has seven elements in it. It has the name of a church is used. Each one's different. Jesus selects a title of himself from chapter 1. In chapter 1 of Revelation, there are 24 titles used. He picks one of those 24 to be the title he ties himself to for each of the seven letters. There's a commendation. There's some good news. There's a concern, some bad news, and then an exhortation. Some good news. Some, it's a report card. Good news, bad news, and then something you need to correct. And then promise to the over then there's a promise to someone called the overcomer. And then we have this strange closing phrase on each one. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit. That's almost a tagline to let you know that's the end of this paragraph, so to speak. Except as we study this, we notice something strange. There is a, first of all, there's a name of each church, and that name of the church turns out to be related to the key theme of the letter. Ephesus means darling, first love. Smyrna was a synonym for embalming fluid. Pergamus is a perverted marriage. Bigamy is a double marriage. Monogamy is a single marriage. Pergamus is a perverted marriage. Thyatira was the name of a, a, a pagan a paganism. And they're sorry, we'll get to each. Each one of them had a, a, a specific relationship to the main theme of each letter. And we, so they're dis, we discovered they're designed. Each one, Jesus takes a title of himself that fits the letter. Then we notice in commendation something surprising. There happen to be two of them that don't have a, each one has something good and something bad, but there's two, there's nothing good said about it. And that should be, we, we notice, by the way, every one of the letters are surprised. There are two that thought they were doing well that weren't. There are two that thought they were doing poorly were not. So interesting, each one is, there's an there's element of surprise here for each one. But then we notice something else. The promise to the overcomer, we notice in the first three letters is a postscript. It's added after the body of the letter, strangely enough. We ca that catches our eye because in the last four, the promise of the overcomer is in the body of the letter. Now, if you take the scripture as uh, sensitive as we try to be, we argue that that's not accidental. That for some reason, that's designed in to catch our attention. There's something different about the first three and the last four that we should pick up on. Okay, with me so far? Okay. We notice as we look at the seven letters that they lay out a history of the... If they were in any other order, this wouldn't be true. Ephesus describes the apostolic church. Very diligent on doctrine, but they lost their first love. Smyrna is a, a symbol for myrrh, and it's the persecuted church. What Satan, uh, uh, Satan persecuted the church, what he couldn't accomplish by persecuting, he did by marrying the church to the world. We get to Pergamos. Each one of these is a phase, if you will, in the in church. And uh, then we get to Thyatira, the medieval church. I'll come back to that. It's the longest letter of the bunch. Then we get to Sardis, the denominational church, which has a shock. 
You have a name, but you're dead. That is not a, if the, 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 uh, the Protestant commentators had a field day with Thyatira because there's so much, longest letter, so much there that relate, seems to relate to the Vatican. Well, if the Thyatira is descriptive of the Roman Catholic era, then Sardis would be the Reformation. Well, if that's the case, the Reformation's got a problem. Because you've got a name, but you're spiritually dead. Wow. And that leads, of course, uh, well, that's followed by the missionary church. That's the one that has nothing bad said about them. And then we get to the last of the bunch, the Laodicean church, the apostate church. Now, what we notice as we study them more carefully, the first three uh, letters have the promises to the overcomer as a PS. So they're distinctively in that way. The last four have the promise to the overcomer in the body. So for some reason, they're distinctive. We notice something else by looking at them more closely. The last four include a specific reference to the second coming of Christ. That's it. In fact, of one of the last four, the first of the four, has a promise that if it doesn't get its act together, it's going to be cast into the Great Tribulation, which is a bizarre statement because that implies if they do get their act together, they will be exempted from that. People need to look at that more carefully. There's one of the last four that has an explicit promise that it won't even be around during the time of the Great Tribulation in the Philadelphian church. And the last two are problematical. So for what it's worth, that's something worth taking a good hard look at. Now, eschatology, study of the end times, can be divided. There are, there are people that take eschatology figuratively, symbolically. They take it as an allegory. That's over on the left side of our chart. There are others that take it very, very seriously, very precisely, very literally. They're at the right end of the chart. There are people in the middle that have pretty much disappeared. There are those that say that all millennial, there is no millennium, okay. There are others that believe the millennium is yet coming. The post-millennial said it's already happened. They pretty much have evaporated in the 20th century because it's been the most troublesome. It's an untenable position to take. A preterism is just a variation of all millennialism. But most of us have been taught that the millennium is for real. We even divide into three different categories, post, mid, and pre-trib, depending on how we feel the church relates to the, to the uh, Great Tribulation. Those that believe the church goes through are called post-trib, and most be, it turns out that most denominations don't really believe in the millennium, and they also believe the church will go through the tribulation. That is a common summary of, I'd say, nine out of ten churches you run into. At the other extreme are people who take the, take the text very, very strictly. And uh, you could call them fundamentalists, if you will. And they would be pre not only premillennial, but pre-tribulational. They believe that the church does not go through the Great Tribulation. There are a group of people that call themselves mid-trib because they believe that they're a halfway thing. And the problem is they have to deny the doctrine of it. Uh, eminence. We'll come back to that. But the main point is, if I know your hermeneutics, if I know your theory of interpretation, I know what your eschatology will be. If you're willing to allegorize these things, treat them symbolically, you'll be up on the left end of this chart. If you take it, uh, if you have a very strict hermeneutic, you take the text very, very seriously, you'll be on the right end. If I know your hermeneutics, I can predict your eschatology. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, your hermeneutics determines your eschatology, as I pointed out to you. Your eschatology will determine your ecclesiology. Depending on what you believe about the end times will cause you to have a view about the church. So your ecclesiology will derive from your eschatology and that's what shows up, for example, in the seven letters, seven churches. And so your ecclesiology then will end up determining your hermeneutics. So it's interesting how the one will determine the other. 
And that's one of the reasons many people go from the King James to something like the ISV. You certainly can't handle, be happy with just a paraphrase. And so, but in any case, all of these always point to the Messiah. That's the equalizing thing you know, all the way around. Okay, let's go on. And then the, the, this begs the other question, is there a literal millennium? This is another debate among most people having to do with eschatology. And the problem you have is the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come is in the Lord's Prayer. What is it talking about? You see, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. And nothing in heaven or earth is more certain. It's in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. What on earth are you praying for if you don't believe there's a millennium? you got a problem. What is it you're praying for? It's an enigma. There's another aspect to bring out here. If you, if you go and get a telescope and look at a star, you see a star. Big deal. You go back to the store and buy a really good telescope, spend a lot of money and get a good one. You discover that same star, when looked at with a good telescope, is actually a pair. There's a quality of optics called resolving power. Will it, is it good enough to discern two things that are almost alike? Same thing occurs in language. We call them synonyms, okay? We use the term kingdom of God. Matthew uses a strange term, kingdom of heaven. Many, many commentators assume they're the same thing and, say, and so declare. The kingdom of God, of course, is everything under God. That, that's an all-inclusive term. But we discover that Matthew only uses a peculiar term called kingdom of heaven. And the of is ambiguous. In both Hebrew and in German, you don't say of, you say from. Okay? And so, the kingdom from heaven, if I say kingdom of heaven, that's fuzzy. If I say the kingdom from heaven, that's clear. It's a genitive of source, not apposition. And so, what's interesting is Matthew uses kingdom of heaven 33 times. But Matthew five times used kingdom of God. And some commentators will say that proves the same thing. No. Matthew's making a distinctive. He's being more precise, more denotative. And so we discover that the kingdom from heaven is a genitive of source in contrast to a genitive of apposition. In other words, when I, if I say I'm Otto von Habsburg, I'm from Habsburg. It doesn't mean I am Habsburg. You follow me? One's apposition, one is the source. And that's what Matthew is doing here. So, but let's go back and look at the text. The millennium was promised to David all through the Old Testament. And there's a bunch of those. It's predicted in the Psalms and the prophets, specifically David, but then all, all through the Scripture. It's not just an Old Testament idea. Gabriel, talking to Mary in Luke chapter 1, promises her that her child is going to sit on the throne of David. That's a millennial term. And so, the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, all through the Scripture. That Jesus will come to rule. That's what Psalm 2 is all about. And that's emphasized in Psalm 110. Jesus is destined to rule on the earth. I love uh, Joel Richardson's title to his latest book, The Jew That Will Rule the, <laughs> the World. That hits it right in the face. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are embracing the idea that he is going to return to actually rule the planet Earth. Not symbolically, literally. And so, the rod of iron, according to Revelation 12 and 19. Every knee shall bow, Paul promises in Philippians. Something else about the millennium that should disturb you. When you study the millennium in the Old Testament, you discover something interesting. The millennial temple won't be open on Sunday. Really. It's only open on Shabbat, that's Saturday, and the new moons. It's a very Jewish observation in the Old Testament and is so going to be reckoned throughout eternity. The return of Christ to rule is the real problem here. 
There are over 1,800 references in the Old Testament. There are 17 books in the Old Testament that give prominence to the event. There are 318 references in the New Testament. Over 216 chapters focus on it. 23 of the 27 books give prominence to the event. And by the way, for every prophecy of Christ's first coming, we've experienced those, we've studied them intensely. Do you realize for every one of those, there's seven or maybe eight of the second coming? Will they be as literally fulfilled as the first coming? Of course they will be. And yet we ignore them. We ignore them. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we all study it in, in Daniel 2, about Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome in two phases. And iron, iron mixed with clay is emphasized. We all study those. When we get to Daniel interpreting that for us, when you get verse 44, Daniel himself takes that vision of Nebuchadnezzar, that dream of Nebuchadnezzar, and says, in the days of these kings, the four he's talking about, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, that's number five of a list of five, which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume these kingdoms, the four that he's talking about, and it shall stand forever. So Daniel is talking about a fifth in a list of five that's going to outlive the others. That's the one we're talking about. Okay. And he says, for as much as thou saw a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, that's the rock that's Jesus, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereever. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof, sure. This is unambiguous. The Holy Spirit's done everything he can to underscore the fifth of the list of five. Not a list of four, a list of five. Okay, is there a little millennium? Well, that leads to another heresy that is widely taught throughout Christianity. And that is that the church somehow is destined to replace Israel. That is a lie out of the pit of hell. And yet it's commonly emphasized in most churches that you'll attend. And, I, and you see I'm being a little severe here. Go to your pastor's library. I don't care who he is. Go to your pastor's library. And in his library, you'll find a set, a set of books called Systematic Theology. And you, if you examine them, you'll discover they have their differences depending on their traditions. But you'll discover something interesting. They all have the same table of contents. They all have a section called Bibliology, a study of the book, what they believe over the Bible. They have a book called Theology Proper, The Attributes of God. They have Christology. The Lord Jesus Christ is one of the subjects. Pneumatology, the Holy Spirit, is singled out. And they'll have their views. They'll differ a little, perhaps. Angeology, they'll talk about angels, both fallen and unfallen. That's a broad topic. And uh, anthropology, that's their label for the study of man as part of God's instrument here. Soteriology, fancy word for what we call uh, salvation. How you get saved. What does it mean? And then ecclesiology is the study of the church. You discover each one of the, oh, oh, there's one more, and that's eschatology. End times, last things. The last things that you study. Okay. What's interesting to me, go to any pastor's library and you'll find his set, and it'll be different. If it's, if it's uh, Dallas, it'll be Lewis Berry Chafer's books whoever. What's interesting, there is a division of theology that will be omitted in all of them. And that section that's omitted includes five-sixths of the Bible. Five-sixths of the Bible. It's called Israelology. Not Israel as we think of it, Israel as an instrument of God's plan of redemption. It's singled out as part of God's program. In fact, the centerpiece of his program called Israelology. And it's interesting. See, we discover 70 different people entered Egypt as a family. But they came out as a nation. That's where Israel was said to be born. The firstborn, God calls them. 
God's firstborn in Genesis 4. Those are, they are contrasted with 70 nations. One thing you don't pick up as you study your Bible, you discover there's Israel and the nations. The word nations is distinctive from Israel as a nation. We think of Israel as a nation. God doesn't. He takes Israel separately, the nations. That's his word for what we translate the Gentiles, the nations. And so they are, they, the single Israel, are designated God's chosen. God's chosen in contrast to the other 70. You with me? That's a very interesting distinction to understand. There's a vital distinction drawn between Israel after the flesh and that portion of Israel within Israel that's saved. Not everybody in Israel is saved. They're styled as the Israel of God. There's a, they are, in Galatians 6, made a distinctive subset by Paul often widely misunderstood. And that same thing occurs in Romans 9. The statement that not all Israel are of Israel. That's the point that Paul himself hammers home. And if you really want to study that, there are three chapters that lays it all out. Romans 9, 10, and 11. Israel's past, its present, and its future. 9, 10, 11. Laid out for you in Paul's thing. Cracks the foundation. You know, one of the things we have to come to grips with is the anti-Semitism of the early church. One of the shocking things that you need to discover as you look at the writings of the first century church is how anti-Jewish it became. It's a shocker. That's what led to our millennialism. That's a byproduct of the... Alli Origin was the guy that treated things uh, figuratively. And he had a big influence on Augustine. And Augustine had a huge influence on the early church. And that led to a concept that we now today call replacement theology. That's a view, an incorrect view, a view that the promises, the covenants, and the blessings ascribed to Israel in the Bible have been taken away from the Jews and given to the church, which now somehow has superseded them. It's astonishing to realize how widely that's taught and how heretical that is. Now, this heresy was a byproduct of the allegorical teaching of origin and the amillennial eschatology of Augustine. And Ignatius of Antioch taught those who partake of the Passover are partakers of those who killed Jesus. Justin Martyr claimed that God's covenant with Israel was no longer valid, that the Gentiles had replaced the Jews. Irenaeus declared the Jews were disinherited from the grace of God. Tertullian, these are all the church fathers. Tertullian blamed the Jews for the death of Jesus and argued that they had been rejected by God. That was the theme they hammered home. Origen is the most guilty of them all. He really led the, uh, that view of things. The Council of Ire. We could go through all of these. That uh, prohibited Christians from sharing a meal with a Jew or marrying a Jew or blessing a Jew or observing this up. These were all prohibited actions. The Council of Nicaea, it was held in Turkey, changed the celebration of the resurrection from the Jewish feast of first fruits to what we call Easter. That's a pagan title, by the way, in an attempt to disassociate it from the Jewish feasts. The Council of Nicaea said, it is unbecoming beyond measure that on this holiest of festivals, we should follow the customs of the Jews. Henceforth, let us have nothing in common with this odious people. That's what they pick up on. Eusebius taught the promise of Scripture were meant for the Gentiles and the curses were meant for the Jews. He asserted that the church was the true Israel. Hilary Partage, we can go on and on with these things. They go on and on. The Jews are the brood of vipers, the haters of goodness. St. Jerome describes the Jews as serpents wearing the image of Judas. Their psalms and prayers are the brayings of donkeys. This is shocking stuff you read. St. Augustine himself asserted that the Jews deserved death and were destined to wander the earth to witness the victory of the church over the synagogue. That's where these ideas are rooted in. There's a term that you should look up in any competent encyclopedia. The term is quattro decimans, a fancy Latin term meaning 14s. 
If a believer, and there were some, attempted to observe the resurrection based on the, the Scripture, which is on Passover, the 14th of Nisan, if he tried to do that, he was excommunicated from the church. And that's why when they had tried to, they had tried to adopt a date for, to celebrate Easter, they worked hard to find one, a formula that wouldn't even accidentally fall on the right day. And that's why there's so many different traditions about Easter, trying to get out from under what this, the Bible is trying to teach. During the Middle Ages, passion plays abounded that they were used to cultivate hatred toward the Jewish people. In fact, the climax comes by Pope Sixtus granted the monarchs of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, the right to establish a special inquisition in Spain to deal with baptized Jews who were suspected of remaining faithful to Judaism in secret. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Thousands were burned at the stake by order of the Spanish Inquisition. If you were Jewish parents and circumcised your children, it was a giveaway that you were cheating. Put to death. In 1492, King Ferdinand decided that all Spanish Jews should be banned from Spain. It was feared that Jews were a danger to Christianity. Approximately 150,000 Jews were forced to leave Spain. On August 3rd, morning before midnight, sailing before sunrise, Columbus and his crew set out his voyage. Why? Because they were Jewish. It's another old story. Now, in contrast to this, we encounter Matthew 25 a very strange parable by Jesus called the judgment of the sheep and goats. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations. Notice who's in front of him. Nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Don't get confused. There's three groups of people here. Before him shall be gathered all the nations. There are nations that we're talking about here. Ethnos, a multitude of individuals. It's a group. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Wow! The interesting thing is they're surprised, though. Naked, ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came to me. Notice this. The righteous shall answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and fed thee, and were thirsty? And they're surprised. They didn't, they're caught by surprise by this discussion. When saw we an angel stranger and took thee in and naked and clothed thee? When saw we thee sick and in prison and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. There are three groups of people here. The sheep, the goats, Oops, and the brethren. The sheep are the ones that are blessed. The goats are the ones that are judged. The brethren are the basis for that judgment. Bear in mind, this is a parable that he's talking about. Then shall he also say, I'm on the left hand, depart from me, ye curse in the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no meat. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also as him, saying, When saw we thee hungered or thirst or stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto thee, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to be talking about the brethren. He's measuring people and how they treat Israel. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now notice this is not a resurrection judgment. There are four groups of people that go into Gehenna. 
the devil's pair, the beast and the false prophet, the unrighteous Gentiles, this judgment. At, this is all at the end of the millennium. The devil and his angels, finally the wicked dead from the great white throne judgment. Here Gentile individuals are being judged and they're doing it on a basis of works. Interesting. The brethren, who is he talking about? The Jewish remnant which has been given the mandate to be his witness throughout the world. The great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble as we often call it. Focus on Israel and specifically the 144,000, his ministers proclaiming the gospel. They will be under the greatest persecution. Certain people will choose to protect them, feed them, hide them, and so on. We can also see the historical application of this in perspective. Studies have been published which show how nations rise and fall in relation to their treatment of the Jews. That may come as a surprise. The Babylonians versus the Persians. Babylonians weren't around. The Persians were blessed. And many Persian, many Jews had offices in the Persian Empire. The Inquisition and the Spanish Armada. The Inquisition wiped out. It, it, they ruled the, the waves until all that got wiped out. The British Empire itself. Nazi Germany, of course, is the ultimate example. And of course, this, the application that Jesus is talking about is yet future. But the essential perspective that we should be taking from all of this, we worship a Jewish king. He's a racial king. He's Jewish. The church was founded by Jewish apostles. We rely on a Jewish Bible. We look for the son of David to come to rule. The Jews' catechism is his calendar. We learn more about all of this by studying his calendar. The prodigal heirs, I like to call them. Why do I call them the prodigal heirs? Israel, God's chosen, failed. Do you realize that? Stephen gives you a summary of it in Acts chapter 7. He lays it out how again and again and again they failed. Israel, as a nation, failed. Don't get too proud. We get to the church. The church also failed. That's what Revelation 2 and 3 Details, Jesus details in his own seven letters. What about replacement theology? <laughs> I remember once I came into Hal Lindsey's study one night and announced him I'd become a replacement theologist. He looked up in shock. He thought he knew me better than that. He says, yes, Hal, I think Israel replaced the church. <laughs> and he cracked up because he realized I'm being elliptical there. That Israel is destined to replace the church. Church will be raptured and Israel will take its place, interestingly enough. Well, okay, we've looked at four of the seven so far. In part two, we'll take the remaining three to explore. Whatever happened to the Davidic covenant? There are four covenants that are that eternal. The one of them that we ignore, we'll explore next time. There's another teaching that has gotten prevalent and it's hard to figure out where it all started. But there's a view held by many that everybody in heaven is equal. That's just a presumption people make that is contrary to what the Bible teaches. We'll talk about that. And that leads, of course, to under grace, does behavior matter? And of course it does because we're all heading for a final exam. And so we'll talk about that next time.